you are listening to the Cabin of Horrors podcast. Go behind the scenes of all your favorite horror movies from the 70s, 80s, 90s, and now. I am your host, the Incredible Josh. Welcome everyone to Season 2 of the Cabin of Horrors podcast. Thank you guys so much for continuing to listen, for all of your support, and all the love on social media. I super duper appreciate it. This is my baby, and this is something that I have absolutely love to do. I'm going to continue to do for months, years, long time down the road. I also have tons of other ideas for great content that I'm going to throw you guys' way in the new year, which I'm super excited about. But season two of the podcast, we're going to do something different than we've ever done in any seasons of the podcast. There's going to be 13 episodes of the podcast, so each of the seasons will contain 13 episodes. In Season 2, we're going to select a movie from each year of the 1980s, starting with this episode, 1980, and we've picked The Fog. The Fog is a great movie, and I find it funny because a lot of people, when I talk about The Fog, they're like, ugh, The Fog? It's so corny, it's so campy, oh, it's so bad. And I'm like, what? (laughs) It It is one of the most suspenseful John Carpenter movies, and it was really well done, so I figured The Fog would be a great pick to kick us off with our decade in review for 1980s horror movies. But the thing is, right, there's 13 episodes, and there's only 10 years (laughs) in the 1980s. So what are we going to do for those other three episodes? Well, I have an awesome franchise review that I'm going to be spreading out over three episodes. Very similar to what we did in Season 2 with the Halloween series, where uh, it was all the Halloween movies reviewed over, well, that was four episodes, but this will be reviewed over three episodes. And I'm not going to tell you what it is yet. It is a surprise, but the only hint I will give you is you don't want to sleep on this franchise. That's the only hint I'll give you, and it probably gave it away. (laughs) But we're going to do a franchise review this season over three episodes, so stay tuned for that. I'm really looking forward to it because this franchise is probably one of my favorites, and it is super awesome and so much fun to talk about. So stay tuned for that. A little bit more about that will come in the probably in the new year. But for this episode, like I said, we're going to be reviewing The Fog, but we're also reviewing another horror movie. So each episode, it won't only contain the 1980s horror movie we're reviewing, it will contain at least one more movie, might be a couple, depends on what we're reviewing at the time or what we're talking about. But for this episode, we have Smile. In my opinion, one of the greatest horror movies of 2022 super well done. It was wildly successful. It made hundreds of millions of dollars this year. And I didn't really see much of a divide on this movie like I've seen in other horror movies of this year, like between Terrifier 2, Halloween Ends, Uma, which by the way, Uma, I don't know if you guys have seen that movie, Uma. It it wasn't as good as I wanted it to be. Man, that movie, I really, because if you guys listened to last week's episode, we talked about Asian horror a little bit. Ooh, spoiler alert, hashtag surprise. We talked a little bit about Asian horror, and I really love it. And I felt like Uma was going to be a movie that Western horror was giving their take on Asian horror, which obviously, you know, that does pose a recipe for disaster. There is tons of ways that could go wrong. But I was hoping they would do some kind of justice to it, and they didn't. I just, I didn't like Uma. I thought it lacked suspense. It lacked that thrilling nature and that hold that Asian horror has on you. I just, I didn't think they nailed that. I don't know if you guys have seen it, but I wouldn't see it if I haven't. (laughs) But yeah, like Smile, I didn't see have really much of a divide. Like there were some people who were like, oh, this is overrated. Oh, this is bad. But it wasn't as loud as the ones that were like, no, this is a really good movie. And I really liked it too. There's a lot of underlying themes in the movie. It really hits home with trauma and mental illness. Like, this movie just went above and beyond in providing a narrative that works and that sticks with you, and that you can really think about at the end of the day. Like, there's very few horror movies out there where it makes you think, right? And it makes you kind of analyze how that fits into society and how a lot of the stereotypes and tropes and some things that may have frustrated you in the movie actually happen in society. It was really well done. I loved Smile. Like, I wouldn't put it as my number one. My number one for 2022 is Terrifier 2. (laughs) That is definitely my number one horror movie of the year. Terrifier 2 takes it for me. But Smile, definitely in my, I would say, top three. I think it would be top three. It would probably, probably be Terrifier 2, Incantation, and Smile. That would probably be my three of 2022. But anyways, let's talk a little bit about Smile. Let's dive deep into it. It's a supernatural film, and it was written and directed by Parker Finn, which is also his directorial debut. 
Smiles based on a 2020 short film that was produced by Parker Finn called Laura Hasn't Slept. And the film stars Sozie Bacon, who is Kevin Bacon's daughter, awesome enough. She plays a therapist named Rose Cotter. She witnesses a suicide of a patient and then begins to go through the same disturbing experiences that the patient did prior to her suicide. The cast also includes Jesse Usher, Kyle Gallner, Robin Weigert, Cal Penn, and Rob Morgan. So Paramount Pictures signed Parker Finn in June 2020. They signed him on to write and direct a full-length feature film, which was based on his short film, Laura Hasn't Slept. The short film had won the Special Jury Recognition Prize in March 2020 in the South by Southwest Midnight Short category, and it was then announced that in September 2021, the film was going to be produced under the title Something's Wrong with Rose. Principal photography on the film commenced on October 11, 2021 in New Jersey, and it wrapped up on November 24, 2021, with editing and post-production of the film starting on December 3rd, 2021. And then this was a long editing and post-production process. It actually went all the way through to the end of May 2022. And that probably was because of the monster that you see at the end. Man, this monster that they give you at the end of this movie, guys, it's unreal. It was actually super well done. Like, if, you, if you're if you a fan of this podcast from, like, the beginning and you've listened to all the episodes, you may have caught in the glimpse that I'm not a CGI guy. <laughs> like, I don't watch the Midnight Meat Train because of how much CGI is in it kind of deal. I don't like CGI. I'm all about practical effects. Give me animatronics. Give me dolls. Give me something that I can actually f- feel is real and not CGI'd. But this, man, when CGI is done right, it is just bar none awesome. And I, I can't bash it because they did a really good job with it. Not only that, but the marketing of this film was absolutely incredible. Almost as good as Blair Witch did back in the day. I don't know if you remember the marketing campaign they did, but if not, we're going to touch on it briefly. We caught our first glimpse of Smile in an 8-second teaser on May 26th, and then a 40-second teaser was released in select theaters in June of 2022. Now, on June 22nd, we got the two-minute trailer and then a movie poster, which is when Smile really started to get some attention. People started talking about it a little bit more. However, (laughs) it wasn't until they pulled a viral marketing stunt at several Major League Baseball games that people really were like, what the fuck? (laughs) Like, they, they did this the weekend before the film dropped, and they had actors who would sit behind the home plate at these MLB games, and they would be caught on film. And they were also wearing the shirt that said smile on it, and they were smiling maniacally into the camera for extended periods of time. It was a great marketing stunt because everyone was like, what the fuck is this? Like, it brought so much attention onto the film, and I think it really played into why this film was so successful in the end of the day. Smile went on to have its world premiere at Fantastic Fest on September 22nd, 2022, with screenings to follow at Beyond Fest on September 27th. It was then released theatrically on September 30th, 2022 by Paramount Pictures, and funny enough, this film was originally slated to be a streaming-only release on Paramount+. Plus. Could you imagine? Like, they would have lost so much bank. (laughs) They changed their minds, though, because they got a really strong result from the test screenings, which was probably the smartest decision they made. Seriously, Smile went on to gross $105.8 million in the US and Canada, with an additional $110.2 million from the rest of the world. So this gave Smile a total worldwide gross of $216 million, which I can only assume is way more than they would have made if it only streamed on Paramount+. Plus. Like, there's no way that that movie would have made 216 million dollars if it was only on streaming so the fact they put it into the box office was the best financial decision they made since then the film has been released on vod platforms it's free on paramount plus you can rent it on prime and all that kind of stuff and it's actually expected to be released today on december 13th 2022 in physical form so if you want to pick it up today is the day to do it So speaking of which, let's head in and talk about Smile. Let's talk about what happens, how scary it is. It is actually, guys, it does have some really disturbing, terrifying moments. Like, it really does. Just that smile alone and the way they do a lot of the kills is just, it it was really well done. I actually, this is a movie that I would have in my collection, hands down. This is a movie I'm probably going to buy on digital and just keep it in my digital horror collection because it's awesome. It's definitely worth watching again and again and again. So anyway, Smile starts us off in a psychiatric ward where we first meet Dr. Rose Cotter, and she's currently meeting with a patient, Laura Weaver. Rose finds out that the patient is a PhD student with a bright future and unfortunately witnessed her art history professor kill himself days earlier. 
Laura tries to explain to Dr. Cotter that she's being haunted by an entity that takes the form of people, sometimes family members who have passed, and they're all smiling and telling her that she's going to die. Now, this film hits hard and it hits fast, by the way, guys. Like, there's no slow buildup like with, you know, some explanation as to what's going on or what's going to happen. They pull you in so fast <laughs> and that hold stays with you throughout the entire film. So during the conversation between Laura and Rose, Laura starts to have an episode and begins screaming in fear and crawling on the floor away from Rose. So of course, Rose goes to call for help. But as she does, she turns around and sees Laura standing up and staring at her from across the room, smiling. And while Laura was having her episode, she had ended up breaking a vase, so she takes one of those shards off the floor and slowly begins to slit her throat in front of Rose. Talk about a way to start a movie. <laughs> that is how the movie starts. And obviously, this incident has a negative impact on Rose, because she's also been a witness to her own mom's suicide when she was a child. So there's trauma here. There's PTSD already here. And there's going to be more of it. That's really the underlying tone of this movie is trauma and PTSD. The themes are just amazing, but we're going to talk about that in more detail later. Rose tries to talk to people and try to get this experience off her chest. At the same time, she's trying to move on from it, though she begins to experience the same disturbances that Laura had before she had committed suicide. Rose sees her manic patient Carl sitting on a bed and smiling at her. When she approaches him, see if he's okay, Carl starts yelling at her saying that she's going to die. So Rose calls in nurses for help, needs to restrain him, but Carl was actually sleeping the entire time. This prompts her boss, Dr. Mogan Desai, to give her a week off due to concerns for Rose's mental health. Like seriously guys, the underlying theme of mental illness throughout the movie is absolutely incredible. Like the stereotypes, responses, the way it's handled is truly on stage here. And the commentary is absolutely incredible. So Rose takes her week off, but her hallucinations still continue to haunt her. For example, she's attending her nephew's birthday party, and she starts to look unhinged and dangerous to the people around her, because as her nephew opens his birthday gift, he pulls out her dead cat from the box, which Rose claims, of course, was replaced by the entity. She also sees Laura smiling at her from across the room, though she's the only one that can see that. So she's having hallucinations, she's, but they're the same disturbances that Laura was experiencing as well before Laura had committed suicide. So Rose decides she needs some help <laughs> and ends up visiting her former therapist, Dr. Northcott. And it's suggested to Rose that these hallucinations and problems she's experiencing, they all stem from her childhood trauma because Rose's mother was abusive, mentally ill herself, and that can play a big role in these kinds of trauma responses. But Rose is not buying any of that. She decides that she's going to do some research and dig deeper into what she's experiencing, right? Like, considering she's not the first to be dealing with this, she figured that, you know, she'd find some deets on other incidents that might be happening. She finds out that Laura's professor was also smiling at her when he committed suicide. So she decides to visit the professor's widow, Victoria, and finds out that he was also affected when he witnessed a woman commit suicide as well. So obviously, Laura points out that there's some kind of chain or connection happening here, so she decides she's going to visit her ex-boyfriend, Joel, who just so happens to be a police detective. They go through police records, and they end up finding several cases where someone had witnessed a suicide and then days later had committed suicide themselves. Later on, it's discovered that all the witnesses of suicides had died by suicide within a week of the incident. So that's where, that's where the ring uh, comparisons, I feel, come in. Like, seven days! <laughs> you know, I feel like that's where a lot of the ring comparisons come in. But while it does play with a curse and while it does have similar themes, they definitely did their own take on it. However, though, there was an exception to this rule of people dying within the week. A man named Robert Talley who instead of committing suicide had actually murdered someone else, and that got the entity off his back. So Joel sets up a visit with Rose and Robert in jail so that they can dig deeper and find out what his experience was. Robert claims that the only way to escape this entity is to kill someone in front of a witness, and it has to be done in a way that causes major psychological trauma. Which I thought was an awesome plot point. <laughs> However, Robert then finds out that the entity is haunting Rose, so he begins to freak out. He tries to get far away from Rose as possible, and then Rose heads out and leaves the jail. Then shit gets real, <laughs> because Rose gets confronted by the entity in the form of Dr. Northcott, her therapist. 
As they're having a discussion, her phone rings, and it's the real Dr. Northcott on the line. So she discovers that the doctor in front of her is not all she says to be. And she heads out, impulsively decides that she's going to drive to the hospital and get rid of this entity. She ends up murdering Carl in front of Morgan in order to pass on the curse. Though we find out that this was only a hallucination. She snaps out of the hallucination, leaves the hospital, and drives away, though Morgan spotted the knife that Rose was carrying and alerts the police. Rose heads out towards her abandoned family home in an attempt to end the cycle because she believes that if she remains alone, well, no one can witness a suicide, so the curse can't be passed on. Makes complete sense. Logical, I like it. Though, the entity has other plans. <laughs> it ends up taking the form of Rose's dead mother, and Rose faces her trauma head on in this. She burns the house down, leaves her trauma in the dust, and believes she's left the entity along there with it. So she heads out, decides she's going to drive over to Joel's apartment for some comfort, but he begins smiling at her. That's right. Rose realizes everything she experienced from the moment she entered that abandoned family home was all a hallucination. And this is where we actually get to see the entity itself. And like I said, I thought it was pretty well done, to be honest. I like this monster. It was pretty sick. <laughs> the entity ends up paralyzing Rose with its presence and then forces itself inside her body through her mouth in what was seriously a sweet CGI spectacle and, of course, now possesses Rose. So Rose left Joel's house, right, in a complete flurry, and he was probably concerned about her. So what does he do? Decides to track her phone. Yeah, and ends up getting to the house where he finds Rose smiling. She sets herself on fire as he watches on, and the entity and curse is passed on to him now. The film ends. Great story. Like, I know I probably don't give it justice by explaining it that way, because it's, it's really one of those films you have to watch and understand the themes and really just dig your teeth into to understand how amazing this movie is. And I really hope you do. I really hope you watch this movie because it has great commentary, great social aspects of trauma, depression, and PTSD. And it's a relatively original idea. Like, I know it takes themes from The Ring and some similar tropes, but it really has a unique spin on it. Plus the themes of trauma, grief, guilt, super apparent throughout the film. Like, you see the narrative through the lens of Rose, but she becomes unreliable in providing that narrative because the lines between delusions and reality start to become blurred. And as a clinical psychologist, she should have a grasp on this, right? And because she doesn't, it really creates an interesting dynamic within the character. They really took the concept of trauma and explored it within the narrative. From the perspective of Rose's colleagues, she could be labeled as experiencing vicarious trauma because of what she experiences with her patients. That trauma of her patients passing on to her, and she's experiencing it kind of like sympathy pains in a sense, you know? Then you have the aspect of the cyclical nature that trauma is, which is seen through the entity's process of causing one victim to spread their trauma to others. And it goes even deeper into the extent of personal trauma, which is shown through the multiple endings, quote-unquote, that Rose experiences when she tries to confront her past trauma. And I know there have been, you know, other horror movies that explore trauma, like The Babadook and It Follows, but at the end of the day, Smile did it in a way that was both frightening and suspenseful. The execution of the narrative and the implementation of these core themes, it's really what is going to set Smile apart from all the rest of the horror movies. And something that makes me happy is I've heard rumblings of a sequel happening, which obviously would make complete sense, right? They left the ending open for Joel to come back and show us his experiences now that the curse has been passed on to him. But at the end of the day, the movie made hundreds of millions of dollars. Any horror movie that makes that kind of bank is destined to turn into a franchise. So I have zero doubts in the world that we're going to get a sequel to Smile. When? I don't know. Will it be good? Probably not. <laughs> but we will definitely be getting another entry in the Smile series because of how much money it made. That alone, there's no way they're putting this to bed. Now that does us for Smile, so we're going to head into our Decades of Horror part of the episode. 